My name is Elizabeth Condon. I live and work in Tampa, Florida and Brooklyn, New York. The show is called Seven Seas, and the Seven Seas was a Polynesian-themed bar in L.A. on Hollywood Boulevard that had a rich history. But by the time the nightclubbers started going, it was decrepit, but I loved it. I loved it, and it was the title that came to me for the show. Well, the exhibition is a series of paintings, acrylic and mylar and mixed media on linen, and then there's also several drawings on vellum. And there's a piece of sculpture. The show was conceived about a year and a half ago. In early 2011, I made a painting called White Lines. It really took me back to memories of the Los Angeles club scene around 1974. And I met with Jane Hart, and I proposed to her that we do a show about this theme. And Jane had lived in Los Angeles and was very enthusiastic. She gave me a date, and I started to work on the show. Well, you know, there's a very narrative aspect to the show in that it represents a landscape from my childhood, and it's also a landscape of sensory memory. I wanted to incorporate some images, you know, that I had actually experienced, for example, samples of childhood wallpaper that I then incorporated into the paintings. And at the same time, the show began to focus around my first trip to a nightclub ever when I was 14 years old. And that nightclub was Rodney Bingenheimer's English Disco, located at Sunset Strip. So it was a very exciting experience and kind of a passage from uh, childhood to adolescence. Rodney's was pre-digital, so it's hard to find photographic documentation, which made it all the more enticing. I would have to go back into memory and then cobble together the experience from these found images on the internet and then combine that with the childhood wallpapers. And then on the other side, there's paintings that are completely abstract that move into sort of the sensory atmosphere of dancing inside of a space. They're just about pure movement and indicate light shimmering on moving bodies. I work on many paintings at the same time, but I don't work on them all at the same pace. And so sometimes putting together the more narrative paintings, you know, it's a constructed painting. You're working with all the elements of composition and really making images work. And sometimes I wanted relief from that. And I just wanted to go into the pure sensory feeling. You have to understand, too, that I was playing tons and tons of music from the period, like the Led Zeppelin blasting, the Runaways. And so, you know, at some points I'd just take off and dance and the paintings reflect that kind of frenzy of the music. You know, you walk into the club and yes, there's walls, floor, you know, people, but there's also then just the ecstasy of colored light and mirrored walls and moving through that space with lots of other people to the music that you love. It's almost like, you know, the ideal for a song. It's like three minutes, 12 seconds. So the abstract paintings are more like three minute, 12 second paintings. And then the constructed narrative paintings are more like rock operas. The abstractions came fast. I mean, I would work on them for very spontaneous periods of time and then let them sit for a while before I would go back to them so that they could stay fresh and light. I really wanted that feeling of just being in the club and dancing, you know, just what that feels like. Whereas the narrative paintings took more kind of knitting things together, more of a collage feeling. For some years now, since being in Florida, I've poured paint onto my canvas, much like a color field painter or an abstract expressionist. I would put the painting on the floor and then pour colored paint on top of it. And that kind of spontaneity or controlled accident, I don't know what's going to happen at the end. So it's like call and response, pour, respond to the pour, then respond to the thing that was responded to. And so goes the painting. Sometimes I'll get in there with a broom. I'll throw stuff in there to make the paint respond differently. But oftentimes I just leave it alone, beautiful and untouched. But then in this case with the seven seas, you know, there'll be a kind of language of wallpaper and Rodney's items and different textures that grow up around those pores to make these paintings. I've started making these vellum drawings in 2010 as a way to trace information literally from disparate sources that I could then project on an opaque projector and then use some of the mark in the painting. But the drawings are really beautiful. And I thought, these are standalone drawings. And I really love to make them. I really love making those compositions from all these different sources. So for this show, The Seven Seas, I worked with images from Rodney's and images that friends sent me from the period. 
they're matrices, if you will, for the paintings. So if you look around at the paintings in the show and then you looked at the vellum, you would see some of the images repeat. Vellum is a, it's a cotton natural weave material that's transparent. Vellum is denser in its weight than tracing paper. It's got a golden hue to it. It has fine hairs and the ink catches in those hairs and it just creates a very beautiful quality of drawing. And I'm using Su Lai Shui Bi brush pens from Taiwan and China that are made for school children to learn calligraphy. So I've done something really new for this show. There's a piece of sculpture. I have to give a lot of credit to Tim McMillan, who worked with me on it from concept to finish. He came into my studio one day and, you know, we were talking about the show and he said, well, have you thought about a replica of Rodney's? And he made a small one that I thought, again, like the vellum drawings, I thought that I would use the replica as kind of a model to build the images of the paintings. But I don't know, for some reason, it, it inspired me a lot to draw in my sketchbooks, but I didn't use it directly to paint from. And then at some point, we just started talking about, let's make it the size of the paintings, you know, let's make it 54 inches. And he just started making these red brick walls and he made the club. And then it didn't seem like it would work. We were both working from memory. I was working from memories of being 14. So we both researched the internet, but you know, the information was scant, but he did build a club. And I went to Los Angeles and I met with one of my friends who was in a band called Lotus Lame and the Lame Flames, who had spent quite a bit of time at Rodney's. And she drew on a napkin where everything in the club was. And that really helped organize us. And so he built the club. And then there came a time when the club was built and we needed to think about a pedestal for it. And so we made a pedestal with mirrors that would then reflect the mylar in the show and reflect the works in the show in the base of it. And then like the last week, we got maniacal about the club. Tim started to make toilets with glitter in them, sinks with glitter in them, you know, things, shiny things. When we really, we both reconstructed rock posters that were in the club and we would hand paint things from photographs. So we were really scavenging those memories and images to try to get this club together. And I have to say, it's really amazing. It's a great part of the show because people have this three-dimensional reference point for the paintings and there's really a dialogue between them. White Hot Shadowy Glistening Flows was one of the first paintings. That is a title or a lyric from a Beach Boys song called Feel Flows that really knocked me out for the fact that it was so shimmery and cool and light and yet the Beach Boys also have such trauma. I was really moved by the Beach Boys when I began to paint this show. I really rediscovered their music in this profound way. And so the painting came very lightly. You know, it was yellow pores and then this silver metallic paint. And it was just gorgeous. I mean, it was so gorgeous that I just looked at it for maybe, I don't know, eight weeks and didn't touch it. But then, you know, it needed more. So then I had a, a moment where I spent two or three days, you know, cutting out mylar pieces that would fit. And it was one of the first times I used the mylar. So I, I didn't know how to judge it in a regular way because it wasn't really painting per se, but it was a kind of visual effect that was really convincing. And yet I wasn't sure, you know, could it be this fun and this great? And then the painting went through another stage where it needed a change in scale and a change in space. And I started thinking about Helen Frankenthaler's fields and how you find space within those fields after you look at them for a period of time. And I started to go into the bottom of the pore and and then I put some boa and rhinestones in it. So I kind of declared the vocabulary of the whole show within the painting, but it, over a huge period of time, like I'd say three months. And the boa and the rhinestones at the bottom of the painting create a spatial zone. And you can start to travel in and out of the pores in conjunction with those elements. And that's that kind of perceptual shift that will indicate to me that something has happened and the painting is complete. The mylar and the rhinestones and even the boa piece became a solution. I mean, there's a quote by Louis Finkelstein, style in a painting is both the glimmering of meaning and a solution, you know, a visual solution. I mean, that glimmer of meaning that one finds in a solution is so vital. And that's the experience of discovery in a painting that you're saying, oh, you get to that point where your back is against the wall and you say, oh, I'll take anything. Just, just let, me, let me get out of this space so that I can, you know, kind of start to calibrate the painting and you find this solution, in this case, in the mylar.
It really works. It really does all the things that it needs to do in this painting. It takes you through spatially, but also through color, and then through the meaning of reflection. And it was as if the white, hot, glistening, shadowy flows painting uh, was a template of materials for the other work. And so when the paintings were underway and still in a very painted stage, it became clear where I could start to apply those new materials. And then I did with increasing abandon. The idea of having a theme for a show has been uncomfortable. I don't want to just kick out shows of paintings that are all interrelated. So it was really vital that discovery came through the material and that I started to understand what the material meant, both in visual and conceptual terms, so that I could apply it with real knowingness. And in some cases, I didn't do it. You know, not every painting needed the same vocabulary. Recorded and produced by George Fishman for QR Art Guide.